come uh, present our showcase this evening. Uh, joining us today is ASB uh, student body president, uh, senior uh, Samantha Meza, and a fellow senior, uh, and uh, I think this is her second time presenting this year, uh, Madison Ostricker. So uh, without further ado, uh, the ladies of Grand Terrace High School. All right, good evening, Board President Bertha Flores, uh, Board Member, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. Um, my name is Samantha Meza. Um, I am the ASB President, and I am honored to serve this year, so, yeah. Good evening, I'm ASB Representative Madison Osterichar, and we are here tonight to proudly present our Grand Terrace High School Showcase in the form of a highlight video. Enjoy. Good evening, board members. It's been a busy year here in Titantown. Here's a recap of everything that we've done since the last board meeting. On September 16th, we hosted three Hollywood-themed grade-level academic award ceremonies for our sophomores, juniors, and seniors outside in our amphitheater. Parents and guardians celebrated with our Titan scholars as they were recognized for their academic achievements from the second semester of last year. ASB students and our mascot cheered on our award recipients. On September 17th, our Friday Night Lights game was dedicated to all veterans and current members of our U.S. military. We rolled out the red carpet as we thanked and celebrated our veterans for their service to our country. Our football team also thanked and showed their appreciation to our service men and women. We were so excited to bring Homecoming Week back to campus this year. Our theme was Adventures in Wonderland. We kicked off Homecoming Week with Alice in Wonderland themed dress up days. On October 1st, we held two outdoor rallies in our amphitheater. Our Royal Homecoming Court was presented to the student body, then went on to perform our traditional waltz and breakout dance. We also enjoyed student performances, games, and, and class chants. Later that evening was our homecoming game, which included a pre-show for our male court members, the football game, and our halftime coronation for our princesses and homecoming queen. On Saturday, October 2nd, we held our biggest GTHS homecoming yet, with nearly 1,000 student tickets sold. Students enjoyed a massive all-you-can-eat candy bar display, photo booths, tacos, funnel cake, arcade games, and dancing. As you can see, our school spirit is alive and thriving in Titantown. We have had several athletic league championships this year so far, including girls volleyball, individual wrestlers, boys basketball, and boys tennis. On October 8th, our Care Pathway students hosted their first blood drive of the year. GTHS Care Pathway students worked with Livestream Blood Bank employees to coordinate this very successful event. We celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month at GTHS with several festive activities and events. Mr. Miranda DJed both lunches with a mix of Latinx music. GTHS student Angela Nunez Mexicano performed Baile Flocorico. Sexta Generacion, a student group comprised of several GTHS and Colton student musicians, performed a concert for our student body during both lunches, and both students and staff danced. ASB also hosted massive games of Loteria during both lunches. We gave away free pan dulce and agua fresca to all students participating and had festive candy bag prizes for all game winners. We brought up about breast cancer awareness on our campus via lunchtime activities, giveaways, and a pink out football game on October 15th. This football game was also senior night for our GTHS football players, cheerleaders, legacy regiment marching band members, and color guard. Our cheer team performed the beginning of the halftime show alongside this year's Tiny Titan Cheer Camp members. 
followed by our marching band and color guard who wowed the crowd with their halftime field show performance. We celebrated Unity Day on October 20th by wearing orange for anti-bullying and hosting our first of many launch on the lawn activities this year. Students were encouraged to have picnics in our amphitheater with friends while ASB supplied umbrellas, music, and games. It was a great unifying day. During the week of October 25th, we celebrated our Rival Week. We had dress-up spirit days throughout the week leading up to our annual Halloween costume contest during both lunches. We ended the week-long festivities with an away game at Colton High School. GTHS leadership students worked long hours to create a fun-filled atmosphere for our visitor side with giant light-up letters and signs. After much anticipation, we welcomed the addition of the Harold Strauss Wellness Center to our campus. We held a special ribbon-cutting ceremony to celebrate its grand opening. Titan students are grateful to have a space on campus where they can feel safe and supported. We were very excited to bring back Synergy this year to our campus. Led by Ms. Bautista, clinicians from our Wellness Center, Ms. Beck and her peer leadership students, 80 EL students and freshmen received social emotional support and enjoyed bonding experiences via family groups and activities during the day's program. On November 13th, our GTHS Key Club leaders took a bus full of spirited members to their annual fall rally held at Six Flags Magic Mountain. Key Club members learned chants and cheers leading up to the event and tried to outspear other regions and divisions during the rally. It was a fun-filled, thrill-seeking day. On November 17th, we held our annual fall festival after school in our GTHS quad. GTHS students enjoyed delicious food sold by clubs, outside vendors, and leadership students. Some booths included carnival-like games and prizes. We also had dance group performances to entertain the crowds. On December 9th, our GTHS choir program hosted their holiday concert. The program included solos, choir class performances, and performances from Terrace Hills Middle School choir students. On December 10th, the CJUSC Student Services Holiday Bus arrived at GTHS as part of their Stuff the Bus campaign. GTHS student leaders helped fill the bus with donations collected from students and staff on our campus. We hope we are able to bring some holiday cheer to our communities. On February 10th, we recognized our winter sports athletes during two outdoor lunchtime rallies in our amphitheater. ASB leaders transformed their amphitheater into a school-spirited experience. After highlighting sports teams and their accomplishments, we played rally games and participated in class chants as we counted down the number of school days left for each grade level until graduation. On February 25th, our BSU club hosted its annual student showcase. For the first time, it was two held outside in our amphitheater. The program featured musical talents by students and administrators, dancing, poetry, monologues, and more. It was a beautiful event that showcased many of our talented Titans. On Friday, March 4th, we held special lunchtime rallies to recognize and celebrate our Winter Court Underclassmen winners and Senior Court nominees. Our theme was Escape to Neverland. ASB leaders dressed in characters as they introduced the court to the student body and hyped up the crowd for our winter formal dance. After being postponed from January to March due to a spike of COVID numbers following our return from winter break, we held our winter formal dance at the Marchfield Air Museum in Riverside on March 4th. It was one of our biggest winter formal dances yet with over 400 students in attendance. The 360-degree camera was a crowd favorite. Our senior winter court winners were announced and crowned. Students had a great time and created many positive memories. During the beginning of March, ASB organized a March Madness basketball tournament. We had brackets of teams that played daily in elimination rounds leading up to the final championship game. We had great participation and look forward to this event again next year. On April 5th, GCHS students participated in the TikTok trend of anything but a backpack day, in which students are encouraged to bring their school supplies and miscellaneous objects for the day. 
our GCHS students came up with some pretty creative backpack alternatives that entertained <laughs> peers and staff. It was one of the many fun spirit days leading up to our spring sports rally at the end of the week. We were beyond excited and grateful to have at least one school rally this year in our gym. Our ASB student leaders worked hard to transform our gym into a Titans of the Caribbean theme experience. ASB students and our color guard collaborated together to create a memorable rally opening. Our color guard then went on to perform their spring show. Song entertained us with an upbeat performance, followed by a rally video with featuring clips taken throughout the year and ending with a countdown of number of school days left until graduation for each grade level class. Next, our prep squad performed their energetic nationals routine, followed by the announcement and recognition of all of our spring sports and athletes. Each class competed in a rally game. And then our GTHS dance group, Timeless, delivered an action-packed performance. At the end of our rally, we celebrated by recognizing our seniors who are pursuing post-secondary education. We revived this tradition we started a few years ago with a special senior walk in which seniors paraded signs showcasing their college, trade school, or military branch. They have been accepted to and or committed after graduation from GTHS. We wish our seniors the best of luck in all their future endeavors. We were very excited to bring back our senior inspiration tradition this year on April 13th. The special dinner for graduating seniors and their parents slash guardians featured a delicious dinner, a senior year highlight video, baby picture and senior picture slideshow, a keynote speaker, parent tribute video, raffles for extra graduation tickets and a free class ring, and concluded with a special candlelight ceremony. Students and parents were encouraged to capture memories and photos, enjoy the quality time spent together, and to finish the school year strong. Earlier this week, Student Services was on our campus distributing golden raffle tickets to GTHS students who met or exceeded the GPA and attendance requirements to be eligible for prizes. We're looking forward to hosting this district-wide event in our stadium on May 4th. Yesterday, we recognized nearly 800 freshmen, sophomore, and junior students at our school awards ceremonies. Students were recognized for academic achievements such as GPA improvement, honor roll, principal's honor roll, Titan Aces, perfect attendance, PAS teacher award, and honor guard. Award recipients were cheered on by family and peers. Following the ceremony, families were encouraged to take photos and celebrate with their Titan scholars. Our GTHS Titans are going places and representing us well. Throughout the school year, we've had several student athletes commit to universities to play sports. Softball player Jaden Kalunga signed with Utah State. Girls soccer player Isabella Ortiz committed to New Mexico Highlands University. Track and field athlete Michael Richard signed to Ottawa University, Arizona. And football player Steven Perez committed to play for Whittier College. Lastly, we are looking forward to our Tale as Old as Time theme prom this weekend at the Classic Club in Palm Desert. With over 400 tickets sold, 360 degree camera and photo booths, music and lighting, ice cream station, casino tables, and exclusive use of the Country Club venue, we are sure prom is going to be a great time. Well, that's all the news that we have for you today. And until next time, keep charging! <laughs>
he's so tall you can't see him <laughs> so uh, you know i love him i love him that much but you know thank you principal there also for your leadership there at the school uh it's just amazing you know you guys need to invite me when you guys got a thousand tickets sold for a dance like that so i can go jam with you guys too okay you're always invited <laughs> so uh i missed the award ceremony yesterday but uh I'm so, so happy. I mean, I, 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 if I could smile, I'd look like the Joker probably. But, you know, I'm very, very impressed. Thank you. Thank you for your, your guys, your, your ladies' leadership uh, as ASB and uh, what you guys are doing. And to the staff at uh, Grand Terrace High School, I applaud you. My hat off to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I know that you guys will be doing great things for the upcoming uh, juniors and freshmen that are coming uh, in this, uh, this new school year. And uh, keep keep charging, keep charging. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Other comments, board members. Six. Board member Ibarra. Okay. Thank you. First of all, I just want to take this opportunity to congratulate both of you and the ASB uh, committee and club to uh, for the wonderful job you've been doing this year. Uh, I think we all know how much effort, time, and dedication you put in besides your schoolwork in order to make all these events happen and happen in a grand scale as you just uh, demonstrated to us. So, um, but we also know that uh, it takes uh, a great uh, support staff to help you. So I take my head off to the Grand Terrace High School administration, their teachers, the student body for, for participating. And just one last thing, it's great to see that students are getting out and having fun. I think that uh, we're releasing a lot of our energy that uh, we had been cooping up for a couple of years and and you're now being able to get out and express yourself. So just just again, uh, excellent uh, video. And uh, it sounds to me like, and it looks like you've had an excellent year to this point. So congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, young lady. Thank you, guys. Okay, we are moving on to 3.0. Uh, 3.1 is uh, we have a presentation, virtual enterprise student recognition. We have Principal uh, Yvette. I want to call her Yvette because she used to be my student in second grade. I can't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Principal Roman. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Flores, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the public. It, was with, it is with extreme honor and pride that I introduce our virtual enterprise teacher, Mrs. Robin Buckles. If you can come on up. And, and our virtual enterprise business plan team, Case of Armor, members uh, whose members are Samantha Figueroa, Stephen Castanon Jr., Isabella Murillo, Javier Murillo, Andy Medrano Jr., Alexander Villasenor. BHS is proud of our students, their efforts and competition at the state and national level, and we hope that you enjoy hearing their presentation. Thank you. Okay, before, first of all, I'd like to say thank you. Um, of course, this is always about the kids. I'm just going to make one comment before I start crying. And then you'll probably see one of the students cry on this. Earlier this year, a comment was made to them. Um, they, were, they were told by a set of judges, one judge, Judge C, because we don't get their names. Judge C, that their presentation was good, but not special. Well... They turned that one comment completely around and just it, one of the students got so upset he wrote it on my whiteboard. Quotes, good but not special. February 2022, Judge C. That's still sitting on my board. No, I don't think I'll erase that. But 
they took that comment to heart and they turned it completely around. They are that good and they are special now. And they proved it to them when they made it to New York. So with that said, I will let Samantha, you can get them in order and get them started. Thank you. Before we like to begin, we would like to thank all the board members for the opportunity to attend nationals. Thank you. Facts. 5.7 billion people carry a cell phone which is 66.92% of the world's population. And normally, these consumers with cell phones have cases on them to protect them from damages. Now, the cell phone case is known as an accessory, and by adding the proper accessory of your choice, you can use your cell phone as a multi-purpose device. Cell phone accessories have different functions. Some are designed for security, some just for looks, and some for safety. Safety can be discussed in multiple ways such as safety from breaking and damaging phones, and safety for one's protection against germs. Wait, germs? That's right, Samantha, germs. How about a cell phone accessory that has hand sanitizer attached in some way? Case of Armour, a self and self-protection company has merged hand sanitizer with a cell phone case. We are a new startup company that has realized one item can have a huge protection impact, not only on oneself from germs, but also on the live stream, aka the cell phone. Not only cell phone case accessories exist within Case of Armor, but there are also accessories for consumers that do not carry a cell phone. You will hear all about these products within this presentation. Hello, I'm Samantha Figueroa, the Chief Executive Officer here at Case of Armor, and this is my incredible team. Howdy, I'm Alexander Villasenor, Chief Operating Officer. Hi, I'm Isabella Murillo, Chief Marketing Officer. Good afternoon, I'm Andy Medrano, Chief Communications Officer. Hello, I'm Javier Murillo, Chief Financial Officer. And I'm Stephen Castanon, the Chief Information Officer. Last year, Americans spent over $3 billion fixing and repairing cell phones. Some states even considered the right to repair legislation, allowing consumers to repair their phones without violating any warranties. And unfortunately, bad hand hygiene is a part of life. Consumers touch hundreds of surfaces a day, all of which contain a world full of germs. These consumers might not realize just how gross their hands really are. So here are a couple problems. Dropping a phone on the ground was a culprit in over 74% of broken phones, and many of them are not cases on them to protect them. Now, how many consumers actually use hand sanitizer? Well, Javier, approximately 85% of adults frequently use hand sanitizer after contact with high-touch public surfaces. 72% of these adults are 18 to 24 years old, which falls under the category of Generation Z. The spread of germs is real. Respondents who were male and of younger age reported less frequent hand sanitizing, which could be due to not having access to hand sanitizer. Plus, cell phones are always accessible, and sometimes the only item males carry. Well, mostly by mail. By merging hand sanitizer with a cell phone case, now everyone has protection anytime and anywhere. A goal that case of armor had was to sell 400 plus products a week to secure strong financial stability early on. Now, that's a main short term goal while our long-term goal is to secure partnership with cell phone kiosk businesses, and also to secure partnership with major cell phone accessory manufacturers and distributors. By achieving these goals, we will be able to protect everyone at any time, as stated in our solution. Recently, we had the honor of presenting Case of Armor's business and mission to the Botanic Garden at the University of California, Riverside, and the California Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Both were intrigued with our business concept and gladly invested funds. This occurrence is a true milestone for Case of Armor. In the real world, Case of Armor is categorized in the mobile phone accessory industry. And within the Virtual Enterprise Hub, we are categorized under clothing and accessories. Case of Armor resides in Southern California, San Bernardino County, which is the largest county in the United States. Founded in 2021, our administration's team has ensured that our company would start off financially strong by bringing forth our own funding. This process has established Case of Armor as an S corporation. Case of Armor's mission is to protect consumers in multiple ways, either financially or sanitarily, with an accessible product that consumers can carry with them at all times. Financially, as in saving money from phone repairs, and sanitarily, by protecting oneself from germs. Our corporation is led by Samantha as our CEO and then flows down to our other five chiefs. 
Our five chiefs then work with department leaders to ensure that all tasks are completed in a timely manner. But as chiefs, we know tasks and duties sometimes need our extra attention and are always willing to step in and assist all departments. This year, marketing, sales, IT, and HR all experienced lack of employees due to COVID-19. The HR department worked diligently to create a COVID-19 protocol form that is listed as the first page of the HR manual. Every strong organization has their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Case of Armor has a few of each. That's right, Samantha. A few of our company's strengths are that we were able to quickly decide upon our product list, along with our phenomenal communication skills among our group. Now, weaknesses do exist within our company, such as an absence of basic business knowledge due to lack of experience. This causes us to be within the wrong industry early on. But Steven, we as a team have figured it out. Opportunities that Case of Armor have are to expand our product line and build partnerships. And a few of our threats would be the constant change in the cell phone industry, along with hand sanitizer being readily available in stores within dispensers. Those are convenient, but most of the time empty. Competitors could be also labeled as threats. And within the virtual enterprise hub, we have no direct competitors. But we do have indirect competitors, such as eCompact, Pandora's Box, and Just In Case. They have slightly the same concept, but different products. All three competitors were found using three key search terms, such as COVID, protection, and cell phone cases. There are also a few real-world competitors, such as Podsheds and HandsGuard. The mobile phone accessories market is growing and projected to grow at a compound annual growth rate of 6.3%, from the expected period of 2019 to 2030, starting at $228.57 billion. Those stats show that we are in a reliable market. However, the current scenario causing delays within the cargo containers is incredibly inconvenient. There's not enough port staff to move containers, not enough truck drivers, and insane levels of congestion. Cargo containers went from taking three and a half days to unload to seven and a half. This is the reason Case of Armor chose to find a manufacturer within the United States. Although we are in the cell phone accessory industry, it does help that the hand sanitizing market boosted from 25 million to over 150 million during 2020 in just four months. These are important external factors that will help benefit Case of Armor. Now, students, 54% of children and 84% of teenagers carry a cell phone. Children and teenagers are usually dropping their phone and dudes not holding on properly. Another target market is travelers. They are always on the go, and in today's world, cell phones and hand sanitizers are some of the most important commonly carried items. Now, since both of these target markets are around numerous others, they can be safe with hand sanitizer attached to their phones. Another area we research are males and consumers that fall within Generation Z. This is due to us young males not wanting to carry multiple items in our pockets, nor wanting to carry backpacks or bags especially in the area we reside, which is Bloomington, California, our small communities located in the Inland Empire, which consists of two counties, Riverside and San Bernardino. Now, North America has had the strongest growth within the hand sanitizing market. We are sure it has to do with the pandemic, but we strongly believe that this growth is going to stay consistent. The collaboration of hand sanitizer with a cell phone case will be convenient for our consumers as they can eliminate germs anywhere and financially beneficial for case of armor due to our residents in North America. You have heard us talk about how you merge cell phones and hand sanitizer together. We've done this in a few different ways. A standard case, a detachable case, an attachable socket, and brace of armor. Which was designed for our consumers that do not carry a cell phone. Such as little kids? Right, Andy. We have designed a bracelet for people to wear that has hand sanitizer built in. All these prices range from $4.99 to $24.99. Social media is the forefront of case of armor. This is where we can direct numerous consumers to our website. Also, attending live or virtual trade shows benefits our company. And of course, influencers nowadays are a huge asset to any business. This is why Case of Armor will reach out to influencers who are concerned about the spread of germs. Such as Howie Mandel. Exactly, Javier. Within our placement, we have projected our monthly highest revenue to generate from online sales at 76.8%. This will then be followed by our network agreements and trade shows. Our company will position themselves in the minds of consumers as a business with two-in-one products. Products that protect against yourself and yourself. There will always be high demand for new features when it comes to cell phones. America's smartphone owners use their phones for shy of two years before upgrading. With this constant change in prices of cell phones increasing, consumers might not want to spend the extra money on a customizable case. Therefore, our team will constantly research how to lower the cost of products. Case Armor's break even point is to be at about 5,000 units with an average selling point of $20. December of 2021, we have broken even due to selling about 400 items per week. Speaking of financials, our summary profit and loss sheet has a 76% gross margin, projected, of course, as of April 30th of this year. 
Thanks, Isabella. Our gross margin was generated by our total revenue minus our cost of goods sold. Also, our company has a four to one quick ratio, which enables us, which enables us to cover all financial obligations with ease. Bringing forth our own money as shareholders and receiving seed money from virtual enterprise assisted with cases of armor starting off financially strong. This proves consumers are confident in our protection and protection in multiple ways. As a customer or investor, whether it be financially or sanitarily, you will be protected with Case of Armor. Protection is a main goal, and we would love to discuss this more as we now open the floor for questions. Again, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity of letting us go to nationals in New York City. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. Board member comments. Board member Haro. I'm going to move that just so I can talk better. Um, to say that as a board member, I am proud of what you've accomplished is an understatement. Um, you're very fortunate to have an amazing teacher um, who has accomplished this feat of sending students to nationals year after year after year. Your class is one that is highly sought after because everybody wants to be a winner and they know that there's a proven record in this class. To each and every one of you, you learned some amazing, and you're not done, but you learned some amazing life skills in this class. The number one fear people have is getting up and speaking in front of people. And you did it effortlessly. And you made us so proud, especially this year, this team, because, you know, the pandemic caused so much chaos. And I know that you went some, through some difficulties of, of uh, where you were going to practice for, for nationals. And there weren't, uh, you couldn't do it at the high school because we didn't have Zoom at the high school. And then CryRop came through and had you over at the offices and did everything they could to do it. This is a joint effort between Colton and the Colton Redlands UKIPA uh, ROP. And it's a program that we are so proud of. And it's because of students like you. And I don't want to miss, uh, I don't want to miss out in saying your other team, your counterparts, although you went to New York and got to, to compete and end up in the top 5% of the country. This school made top 5%, 3,000 schools participated in this. That is tremendous. And while your, uh, the other team we had, eCompact, didn't make it to New York, but I know that they participated in an Inland Empire competition and brought $5,000 back to Bloomington and to the program. So this is an amazing amazing thing and so we are so so proud of you and uh, again i want to thank your your teacher and your teachers and everyone i know you had chaperones who went and i, I saw the social media pictures you had new york pizza and and got to go to go to go to times square and celebrate safely and so i just wanted to say congratulations um just a tremendous congratulations to you and the other team as well uh, for all that they've accomplished this year because we are so proud of each and every one of you. Board member Thorne Mojeda. Mrs. Haro shared just about anything that uh, we would be able to I don't know how we can top that because we are all so very proud of our students uh, for what you did. And and I'm glad you had a good time on your trip as well. And that's kind of a, a bonus for all the hard work. When I see a teacher with the kind of passion that I saw tonight, it almost makes me cry. That passion is contagious and I see it in you. And I see it in your accomplishments. And as you move on in life, Take that passion with whatever you are interested in and make it grow and continue to grow because that's 
how you succeed in life. And remember always that there are people each and every day in our schools who want that for you. And I thank you for bringing that to our children. And you did a great job. So me. <laughs> so thank you very much and congratulations. You did a wonderful job. Board member Fuentes. You are not only special, but good. No, awesome. You guys are awesome. Let's give them a hand. Your passion comes from your teacher. And I know that my colleagues have said that. I can see the way you guys talk, the way you guys express yourselves. You have the passion. You have that motivation. And whatever Judge C said, that little seed he, he kind of planted in you technically made you do better. And I am so proud of each and every one of you for your accomplishments. I, can, I can't wait to have the little sanit I'm getting rid of this case, guys. You know, I got the sanitizer here. So I wish I could. You know. I'm getting rid of the case. So I love it. Congratulations. My colleagues have said everything. I think Ms. Harrell really shared, but we are, we're so proud. I, I don't have words to say how proud I'm of each and every one of you. Ms. Buckles, congratulations. Congratulations. The second time we have students. Students that actually go, you know, out there and they make it happen. And you have it. Thank you. Board member Ibarra. You definitely have the winning formula and the word is out. I also like to give uh, my congratulations to each and every one of you. Excellent job, S superior performance. And it's, it's interesting to say that, you know, there's times where people don't give us the credit and we shine above that. And you guys all did a wonderful job. Uh, I'm very fortunate to sit on this board, but also uh, the sitting uh, member of the foundation for president as Cryrop. And so, and Pat Haro is also on, uh, on that board. And so is Israel Fuentes. And I have to just take this opportunity right now to say that the people in Cryrop, the superintendent, the administration, were so elated by your success. And they felt so wonderful about the opportunity that they were able to help you prepare for this trip and do as well. So I just wanted to make sure that I get this chance to share how, not only how we feel here at Cone Joint Unified School District, but how the Coleman Redlands Yucaipa ROP feels about your success and the success of your teacher. So thank you very, very much. Board member Flores. There we go. Well, it, it's, it's been said, but it bears repeating. The presentation was, was awesome. It was phenomenal. The confidence that you exude, um, Speaking in front of people is always difficult. It's difficult for everyone that's, that, that people do it all the time. So the fact that you have such confidence, you're so articulate, says a lot. But I also want to I also want to echo and I appreciate the fact that you shared that vulnerability, that story about the critic that motivated you. Um, it's nice and it's great. We love it when people say wonderful things about us. Oh, great job! And we love to throw praise onto our our students, our family our friends, and, and, and we should. They deserve it. Um, criticism, though, if constructive, is also really helpful. Um, but there's also just going to be flat-out haters, right? <laughs> but that can be wonderful, too. Um, I'll share with you briefly, this is a, this is a critic's review of an individual uh, from several years ago, about 20 years ago. This is what somebody said once about another individual. And it's a, it's a, it's a sports reference, but bear with me. This guy said, this guy is a poor build. He's skinny. He lacks great physical stature and strength. He lacks mobility and ability to avoid the rush. 
He lacks really strong arm. He can't drive the ball downfield. He does not throw a really tight spiral. He's a system type player who can get exposed if forced to ad lib, and he gets knocked down really easily. That was a scout's report of Tom Brady in the 2000 NFL Combine. Tom Brady regularly, regularly references back to that criticism, that report, as he tells people, never give up. Never give up your dream. Never stop working. And just because others may say critical things about you, they don't define your future. They don't define who you are. And it, your future is in your hands. So I hope you guys send Judge C a, a thank you note wherever he is. I, I wish we had his address. Because he is what made you who you are. And I appreciate you uh, sharing that story. And I hope you share it with others because it's easy to um, shut down when you hear some of those critical things. But the strength that you've demonstrated in growing stronger and better, that's, that's a lesson in and of itself that I hope you carry with you throughout life. Because that indicator of resiliency is the number one indicator of success in life. So congratulations. You guys have done an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you so much. You made us very proud. Okay. Do we, uh, would you like a picture? Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. If you want to come this way, and we will give you your certificates as well. The way she presented, you know why she's this. Um, I, I have a, she's a junior, so I have a junior that will become that. Yes. When you started reading that, I remembered that. I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay, we will continue with item 3.2. This is for the Colton High School Young Legislators Recognition. The Board and the Superintendent would like this opportunity to recognize two Colton High School students.
Denise Diaz and Michael Duke Medina. Woo. Last Saturday, the Colton High School students were recognized by Assembly Majority Leader Eloise Gomez Reyes's office for participating in the Young Legislators Program. This year-long program was designed for high school students living in the 47th district interested in gaining leadership development opportunities. During the program, the young legislators learned about state government services and the legislative process. On behalf of the board and superintendent, we would like to present certificates in honor um, to honor each of you for your accomplishments for participating in the program. So they want to come up? Yeah, thank you, Board President uh, Flores. And just, uh, I was able to attend the 47th uh, presentation in the ceremony and the graduation for the students. And uh, it was amazing to participate. I know we had uh, Mr. Fuentes there. Uh, and what they accomplished, uh, I think, is also huge. Uh, and what they did and their dedication and commitment to their civic duty. I mean, they, they went through a whole uh, year's program and they had a lot of work to do. So it was very impressive. Uh, so we thought we'd recognize them tonight with a couple of recognitions or certificates on behalf of the board. So first, uh, and I think I know he's here because I talked to him at the ceremony and his family. Uh, I'd like to call up uh, Michael Duke Medina. Duke, by the way, he uh, gave a speech uh, at the, I'm not going to ask him to do it tonight, but he gave a, a phenomenal speech at the uh, event. Uh, so he's an incredible speaker, too, uh, very insp inspirational. Uh, so uh, just, we were so proud of you, Duke, uh, in representing the 47th District and, and actually giving that speech. Uh, that was that was awesome. So congratulations, Duke, again. And we expect great things from you. So, <laughs> so good job. Yeah. Right. And I don't believe she's here, uh, or she's back there. Where's she? Oh, great. Hi. Hey, okay, Titan's here. And so we also want to recognize tonight Denise Diaz. Golden High School. First. Sorry, Denise. Uh, so we want to give you this. And she's wearing a letterman's jacket there, representing ASB, and just. Uh, Cheer, right? class of 23. Yeah, so give it for Denise. <laughs> and they're both juniors, so we are excited to see what they're going to do next year. Moving on to item 3.3, employee recognition. I would like to invite Dr. Kathy Cervantes to recognize our employees. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the community. The Human Resources Division is honored to congratulate and celebrate our March, April Employees of the Month to be selected and nominated by your peers among our thousands of outstanding employees is a tremendous accomplishment. 
All of our nominees and our award winners have shown dedication, compassion, and motivation for the work. We offer congratulations to our exemplary staff and thank them for their wonderful mo model they set for others. We would like to publicly recognize our winners tonight and invite them to join us along with their family and their supporters when we call their name. Our certificated employee recognition recipient is Morgan Clark, teacher at Colton High School, and honoring her this evening is John Abbott, principal. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board Members, uh, Superintendent Dr. Branda, Executive Cabinet, community, students, families, and community partners. Uh, we just thank you for allowing us to celebrate amazing educator here at Colton High School, Morgan Clark. And I've only been at Colton High School's principal for the last two months in my short time with Morgan. I've been highly impressed by her ability to engage with our students and lead our students and highly impressed by some of the work she's doing with, uh, in particular, a couple of our student clubs. Uh, but I don't think I could do it uh, as much justice in celebrating uh, Ms. Clark um, without having our amazing assistant uh, principal, Jennifer Cruz, who's been working alongside her all year. So she's going to go ahead and speak on behalf of Ms. Clark. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, members of Executive Cabinet, and audience members. I have the pleasure of honoring Morgan Clark. I have known Morgan since she began as a science teacher at Colton High School a few years ago. Ever since I met Morgan, she has had a warm and welcoming demeanor with anyone that she interacts with. Ms. Clark quickly connected with the Colton High biology team and jumped right into collaborating with them and contributing ideas for developing engaging biology lessons. As one of her colleagues stated, Morgan brought her fierce knowledge and love of her subject, as well as fresh ideas to the classroom. Ms. Clark takes time to ensure that she provides a safe and inviting learning environment for her students. When you are in Ms. Clark's class, it is clear that she loves science and she loves teaching science. Not only is her classroom visually appealing with the colorful and custom made instructional bulletin boards that she creates and displays around her classroom, but I have witnessed how it is a place where students feel safe to learn and a place where they feel that they have a trusting and supportive adult in Ms. Clark. Her students know that if they are in need of someone to confide in when they need help, they can go to Ms. Clark and they know that she will get them the support that they need. I have seen that Ms. Clark regularly ensures that her students have their learning needs met and that they get the instructional support that they need. She also ensures her students have their social emotional needs met and teaches students to advocate for themselves teaching them self-care strategies, coping mechanisms, and goal setting. One of Morgan's biology team members stated it well when she said that what really sets Ms. Clark apart from other teachers is her commitment to teaching the whole student. Morgan exemplifies this inside the classroom as well as outside of the classroom. She currently leads Colton High's National Honor Society and the Intersectional Feminist Club. We are fortunate at Colton High School to have Morgan as part of our staff. She has not only had an impact on our students, but has also had an impact on our staff. She has shared her science and instructional knowledge with her peers and has been a support for our new members of the biology team. It has been an honor watching Morgan become the educator that she is today and I know that she will continue to have a great impact on those she works with. Thank you, Morgan. It has been a pleasure to work with you and congratulations.
Our Management Employee Recognition recipient is Ms. Melissa Williamson, Director of Child Development, San Salvador Preschool. Honoring her this evening is Dr. Syed Hyder, Director of Education Services, TK through 6. So we invite Melissa Williamson and her family and supporters to join in her celebration. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board Member Superintendent Miranda. It is my pleasure to introduce our Management Employee of the Month, Melissa Williamson. As you can see, the cheering party that's behind her, that's just enough to say why she is such a special leader. So the first word that comes to my mind when I think of Melissa is the word passion. Melissa is extremely passionate about the preschool program and is always going above and beyond to help her students and their families. Since she was hired, she's been working relentlessly to shine a light into our early education program and make it a dynamic and exciting program for the little ones. She has turned San Salvador into a welcoming place where students feel loved, parents are welcomed, and staff feel appreciated. Here are some quotes from San Salvador staff about Melissa. Melissa has really changed our school. It now looks like a school from a beautiful book. I'm very happy to be part of the San Sal team. Another office staff said, Melissa Williamson has made a significant impact in my life, not only in my job at San Salvador Preschool, but on a personal level as well. She has immense love for children in our school that never goes unnoticed. A teacher said, it is obvious Melissa cares about children. When you visit the school, you will find her in the morning greeting the children and their families and calling them by name. It makes a huge difference to the children and their families to know that the administration cares enough to greet them and wish them a good day at the end of each day. Another staff member said, we are extremely fortunate to have Melissa as our leader because she understands what early learning is about. And she strives to create that atmosphere at San Salvador. Now, some of you may know San Salvador has a large special ed population. Recently, a special ed teacher requested Melissa for some assistance with her students in her classroom. Instead of meeting with the teacher for a few minutes, or assigning somebody to help the teacher, Melissa told her executive assistant to clear her calendar for a week. She worked with the class and formed a bond with a student who needed support. She not only developed a relationship with this child and his parents, but also developed true affection and understanding for the family. Melissa Williamson is a caring leader who demonstrates her dedication, not just by words, but by her deeds. I am honored to recognize her as the Management Employee of the Month. Dr. Chavantes, if I may, I would like to add a few words. Okay. And with your permission, Bonnie, I would like to share a little bit. Um, Melissa's parents are behind her. There's um, Bonnie Simpson. She was a teacher, a special ed teacher, a regular teacher. I don't know how many hats she wore for years, and she retired. Um, I had the honor and the pleasure of having uh, Becky Simpson, and that's Melissa's sister, about 18 years ago. And Becky, as, as Melissa's standing here, I have no doubt that there was another shining star in, in the midst, and that's why I'm taking a few moments just to tell you that I feel honored that as principal of Simonon Elementary School about 18 years ago, this young lady walked into our school, and Bonnie was a teacher there also, so it was a mother and daughter. And um, like I said, Bonnie exemplified every part of what a teacher should be in her short 
time at Zimmerman. And um, just 24 years old, I believe, fresh out of college. And, um, and, and Bonnie passed away that year, the first year. And it's just every time I see Melissa, I see, I see Bonnie. And um, I mean, I see Becky. And, and I'm just, uh, Bonnie, I just want to say Bonnie and, uh, and, and Mr. Simpson. Thank you so much for lending us your daughter for the one for the short time and Melissa and she's here today. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for what all you do. I get to say a few things. Good, good evening, Board President Flores, um, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and Executive Cabinet and members of the community. I would be remiss if I accepted anything without acknowledging the staff members behind me. At this, at this district, we have an amazing early education program, and I'm only as good as the people that work with me and support me every day. I have the best job in the world. I sometimes can't believe I get paid for what I do um, because we we truly love students and families um, in our in all of our schools, San Salvador, and we have nine other locations as well. Um, we've had to show up these these past few years, and we've been stretched to the limit. And my staff members have shown up, and they have done what it takes for students. And so I'm honored. I'm proud. And I thank you for this recognition and for the support of my husband and my children, and my parents, and my admin assistant, Anna, and my um, assistant principal, um, Ms. Leah Leptak and Mariana Troy. We're a good team and that's, that's what makes it. It can't only be one person. So thank you. Thank you, thanks. Melissa, do you mind uh, introducing us to your uh, family, your yes. husband and kids? So this is my dad, um, Bob Simpson, and my mom, Bonnie Simpson, and my husband, Dale Williamson. This is my sister, Christina, <laughs> and um, my son, Joshua, and Dylan, and Mackenzie, and these are all staff members. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cervantes and Dr. Hyder. Before we go, um, we just want to offer a heartfelt congratulations to all of tonight's winners, and, and we encourage our CJUSD staff to continue to acknowledge and nominate more of our outstanding employees. Thank you, and have a good evening. Thank you so much. Moving on to public hearing 4.1. Public hearing concerning the public disclosure requirements of AB 1200 for the certificated salary adjustment for the 2021-2022 school year. And opening for public hearing. Are there any public comments regarding the public hearing item 4.1? No comments? We're closing this uh, public hearing. Item 4.2, public hearing of the Colton Joint Unified School District on increase of statutory school fees and adoption of fee justification reports of res residential and commercial industrial development. Open the public hearing. Any public comments on this 4.2? No public comments, okay. We are closing public hearing. Moving on to 5.0, we have public comment. 
And um, I, first of all, I would just like to say that Board Bylaws 9323 state that individual speakers shall be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item to 15 minutes. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. The president may take a toll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask that additional persons speak only if they have something to add. Okay. And um, we have, have uh, we ask that the appropriate public comments be filled out and each speaker again will be invited to the podium. We ask that you begin by stating your name and your city of residence. Uh, first speaker is Christina Parachi. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board Member Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and member of the audience. I'm Christina Poracci, and I have the honor to represent the Association of Colton Education as a president. Today, I'm here to talk to to introduce um, some of the new elected board members for ACE. Um, ACE had an election for multiple positions. Not everybody was able to make it. Um, my right hand, Vice President Paul Lucero, he has been reelected for two years. Um, I have for high school director Camille Butts and Steve Barton. Uh, Steve Barton is a new elect and Camille Butts will uh, be, uh, she was reelected. Elementary director Claudina Flores, she's coming back. She took a break of a year and now she's coming back. She likes to be informed. And uh, Leslie Anderson was reelected. At large director, um, it's Jamie Blinkensop. She's brand new. She doesn't know what she got herself into it, but um, it was time for her. And I also want you to know that um, I've been reelected for two more years, so we're going to have to deal with me for two more years. Good luck. Uh, we also voted on our tentative agreement, and um, I will have uh, uh, Paul Lucero. He is uh, one of the bargaining team to speak on that item, but um, we encourage that you vote yes and approve um, what our membership majority, our membership voted actually overwhelmingly voted yes on the tentative agreement. Thank you. Next speaker is uh, Paulo Serra. Good evening, everyone, school board. My name is Paulo Lucero. I teach at Joe Baca Middle School, and I am the vice president of the Association of Colton Educators. I'm speaking tonight in support of the tentative agreement reached by the association and the school district. It's item 7.61 on the school board agenda. Our membership voted overwhelmingly in support of the settlement. And while not perfect, this is the best option we have to get much needed money to our members who have been working diligently through these unprecedented times. I believe this is a good start to get us to the next year to next year's negotiations. Sorry, and look forward to continuing this positive process and opening the doors to increase settlements to make Colton competitive and pay with the surrounding districts. Again, thank you, and uh, I definitely encourage your support. Thank you, Jeremy Elkins. Good evening, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Elkins. I'm here to talk about myself as an employee of CJUSD. Does anyone know the definition of equality? It means the state of being equal in status, especially in rights and opportunities. Is work-related trainings a right or an opportunity? Either way, it still falls under equality. I was denied, not invited, not, not informed of trainings that all of my co-workers co had the luxury of going to on numerous occasions. I've been empl uh, employed by CJUSD for over 18 years. My, my grandparents, parents, myself, my daughter have all been students of CJUSD. For the last seven years, I've had perfect attendance, completed 24 heating and air conditioning classes, two general maintenance classes, 17 uh, business management classes, and seven art classes. For what? To be passed up due to discrimination? This act is barbaric, and management has the gall to ask why Imano's morale is so bad, really? I was doomed before the interviews even took place. The, the interview consisted of things everyone else was trained on, but I wasn't. Is that equality? 
More recently, I was called a cancer by MNO manager, and he also said the district needs chemotherapy. His response to this was, it was taken out of context. If that's true, then that means he admitted saying it, but meant it in a different way. So my question is, what was the correct context in calling me a cancer? You haven't even followed your own policy that you guys created. I invite the board to reread policy 4030 and 4031. It's 2022 and these acts of discrimination shouldn't be happening. And if they are, the board the district needs to take action instead of sweeping it under the rug. I'm not letting this issue die out. I'm not letting this go until things are made right. Is this how hard working, dedicated employees deserve to be treated? Your motto is CJUSD cares. So I'm asking you guys to prove it. Make sure you don't look at my car, please. Okay, <laughs> all right. Now, just... All right. My name is Lisa Via, and I'm from Colton. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Via, and I'm a parent and employee of the Colton School District. I hope you all aren't all thinking that it's all good now. Good, and I have and I have just let things go because I have not been I've been quiet for these past couple of weeks. But I am actually giving the new principal of Colton High the opportunity to get hit on his feet, get his feet on the ground, and start to clean up the issues that the previous principal principal was allowed to continuously mishandle despite the countless complaints and facts that were pointed out to the Colton School Board. Besides being a parent, I'm a longtime Colton School District employee, and I have worked for the security department for most of that time. I believe that all districts should be transparent and there should be nothing to hide. After all, parents, students, employees see the daily functions of our district anyways. Safe, school safety is a national topic. I'd like to point out just a couple of recent facts of the daily functions within our security department. Our security department teams are short every single day at the middle school and high schools. My children, grandchildren, coworkers, and myself are left with an inadequate amount of security. This poses a serious threat to all of us. The security department has been inadequate long before the pandemic, so let's stop using COVID as an excuse for all the inadequacies of the school of, within our district. Why haven't substitutes for security been hired a long time ago? How is this not a high priority? There's a high school this week that is being ran with eight security while another high school is ran with just three. Last week at one of our high schools, they only had one security. So they scrambled to get coverage from other sites to help out. So in turn, all of the other secondary and post-secondary schools ran even shorter to fix that. Why is there three female security at one site alone while other sites don't have any female security? Don't, does that make any logical sense? Our security manager, managers recently hired two substitutes. They did some kind of quick fix, one day orientations and threw them out there with us so we could shadow them. Wait, so we ourselves are training employees now while the security managers are getting paid big bucks? If it was so easy to quickly get these two people out there, why didn't we have those bunch of people long before? Why have we been adequate all these years? Years! Why are security managers getting paid big dollars when our, when our security department is mismanaged? There's poor leadership, they abuse their power, and clearly do not care about the safety of all the students and staff of our Colton School District. Thank you. Next speaker is Rhonda Fagan. Thank you for cleaning that. I appreciate it. So, again, the can you put on? That's going to be my enemy. So, sorry if I'm focused up here because I'm watching how much time I do this. And I do this off the cuff with not uh, anything written. Wow, that was so interesting. Oh, 
So what's sad is you guys, and then this is how you do it, but what's sad is these comments and mine are not being heard by your, your uh, white audience. I wouldn't want the kids here, I've said that before, and I wouldn't want all the crew tenants and all the applause of employee. What kind of, y'all should have booked that in a different place. But I'm here like the man who just left to give the reality. I apologize, uh, my name is Rhonda Fagan, Grand Terrace, California. I apologize for missing last month. I think it was around my uh, birthday party, so I had other things uh, planned, but I wouldn't miss a, a board session. So let me go, I've got two minutes and 25 seconds. I actually am going to talk about uh, the lack of fire safety at Bloomington High School. I saw Ms. Roman for the first time, but listen to Ms. Villa as a parent and employee. It's just an embarrassment. And the thing is, you guys have to understand, I've probably said this before, the chain, the chain is as strong as its weakest length. You shouldn't have to have Rhonda Fagan, Lisa Villa, and the other man coming here telling me what your problems are. You're busy having cake and ice cream and applauding in this session. I think it's just despicable. And I'm going to tell you today, before I get to the fire safety issue, and I might have to move it till next month, and I will also be here in June if you're, if you're I just came from from um, a session with the EEOC of Los Angeles, and that man said he also has a complaint. So I have a religious discrimination complaint against you guys and retaliation. Today, I want you to know Colton Joint Unified if you've never been put on notice, I put your entire district on legal discrimination notice at the EEOC Los Angeles. I hope they send the charge of discrimination this week. I told them to send it to Frank Miranda. But if they don't, then they only take 10% of their cases anyway. But I did my due diligence to make sure that your district is on record for how I was treated as a former employee and as a substitute teacher in this place. As far as fire, fire safety in Bloomington High School, the fire alarms go off on a regular basis. They go off so much that in my experience while I was there, the kids are becoming engendered to not caring. And what's going to happen, and I mark it today with only just over a minute to talk, is what happened in North Detroit with that boy shooting and the pandemonium that took across that high school, I think is going to happen in this district. And if it happens under Yvette Lamont's uh, watch in Bloomington High School, I won't laugh because I don't want anyone hurt, but I will say, you know what, I said something about that three years ago at a board meeting. I have more to say next month and the following month if you're in June session. I'm going to talk about exactly what's going on in the classrooms at Bloomington High School that I experienced, which are despicable, that I've been telling parents in the area and I may raise to higher levels in the state of California. Overall, like that man was speaking, I mean, 18 years, I can't, I've never worked for you guys 18 years. Lisa V, I haven't worked for her, worked for you guys as long. I've worked for you guys less than six months. What the heck is going on in this district that you got people like that who's giving you guys a lot of years disgruntled, Ron is disgruntled just because you guys are messy, but that was six months or less. These people have given you their employment time. I'm disgusted. I didn't get a chance to talk about the fire safety. I'll do it next time, and I will talk about um, some more stuff at Bloomington High School in June. So I'm here to whistleblow, and unless I'm dead, I'll, I'll be here, and I, I promise not to miss it. Rhonda Fagan, thank you. Rhonda, need applause. Moving on to 6.0, administrative presentations. I have a, a request before we move on. Um, I'd like to uh, get more information, uh, uh, Dr. Miranda, on the, on the gentleman that uh, spoke from maintenance and operation and his situation. This is the first time I've heard about it. And uh, just to, to find out if there's something that. Oh, it came out today? Yeah, or follow up on what's, what's happening there. Okay. Okay, we have item 6.1. Uh, local control and accountability plan with Assistant Superintendent Dr. Peterson. Good evening, Board President Flores, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and uh, members of the audience. It's my pleasure tonight uh, to present our April update for our 2022-23 um, LCAP. Uh, next slide, please. Um, tonight's presentation uh, will be quick. And so um, we're going to give a little bit of information, the LCAP update, uh, some information on our educational partner engagement process, and then through that process, the determination from the committees of the LCAP one-time funding items for next year. Um, if you recall, uh, about a month ago, I was here in, Feb or in February, I was here to present the mid-year LCAP supplement. At that time, we went through the metrics, the um, actions and services and the, the goals of the LCAP. And so that was our, our first presentation for um, the information for next year. Um, as far as those go, um, there's one metric being added is added to the secondary level, which will be the NWEA or MAPS assessment um, for our students. And the remainder of the 
um, metric items will continue um, into 2022-23. If um, you recall, this is the first year of our three-year um, LCAP, L LCAP. And so um, left uh, as far as um, prior to uh, getting board approval for the entire LCAP, um, first is at this point we are um, um, beginning the writing process um, to complete that by June. Uh, we will be making the same presentation that we make to the board in June to our all PAC committees, uh, which uh, on, on what we're calling all PAC on uh, May 9th, and um, that is all of our parent committees um, joining together that night to um, uh, be given that presentation. And then we have our LCAP uh, public hearing and presentation June 9th and the adoption of the LCAP on June 23rd, and then the final product due to the county by June 30th. Next slide, please. And so the final piece um, before we, we bring it to you for approval is our LCAP one-time funding. Um, in the past, we've had a, a specific dollar amount to bring you, um, and we knew ahead of time that dollar amount, and we're able to give you exactly what items we were going to um, approve um, in a new LCAP. Uh, uh, this year, due to different budget processes, uh, we are um, less certain of what that dollar amount will be. And so what we've done is we've had a, a ranking of the items from our, um, from our committees um, to move forward so that as we, as we get additional funding, we'll, we will basically go from one to, one to 22 on this list and, and check those off and, and fund those items. Um, again, these are one-time funded items, which means they're, they cannot be personnel or ongoing items that, that require multiple years of, years of funding. And so just to kind of go through a little bit of, of those tonight, the first three uh, were actually, if we have room, once we once we get our May revise and are, and are close to our actual numbers um, for next year's LCAP um, total budget, uh, we're, the first three items, the transportation athletic department budget and avid site support increase, we were trying to actually move to that side to um, continual, continual funding increase um, with the cost of personnel going up and um, uh, cost of items within those departments, there's a need to increase. They have not been increased in, in quite a few years. And so the other items on that list are, are the one-time items. And so starting with number four, um, libraries, including books in Spanish, our uh, visual and performing arts department has put together a plan um, this year and will continue um, putting that plan together next year. And so we're providing some funding to um, support the implementation of that plan. Uh, ice station for our dual immersion program, student field trips for each of our school sites, professional learning without subs so that we can provide um, either after school professional learning or during holidays and breaks. Um, science fair support with our Z fair license, safety supplies for backpacks in the classroom. Um, additional athletics equipment, weight equipment and PE equipment at the, at the three high schools. And then some additional funding for Silver Mountain High School for some instructional materials and incentives and field trips. Uh, some electric pencil sharpeners for teachers, um, our DSDP or uh, CJUSD design plan support. Um, 3D printers for our MESA, some of our MESA programs or our, our STEAM programs. And then um, PD for cultural proficiency and equity and then elementary science and social studies. And then funding, funding to sites um, to um, four print shop posters was was a was a um, a request, and then finally uh, Scholastic News magazine for all of our elementary sites, and so these are the items that total about two million dollars, and and we are hoping that we're able to fund um, each of those um, for next year, and so this will come back with what we presented on the twenty eighth into our final final plan that we bring back in June, and so next slide please. And so just quickly wanted to provide that to you to allow you to make any comments or um, suggestions and um, as we finish up this process. And so can I answer any questions you may have? Again, wanna thank everyone on our committees and, and that's involved in this process because it is, it is truly a, a community uh, partnership. The list. And do you want to do you want to say too that this is we do have other funding available for um, through federal funding and things like that and grants 
um, for other items that, that may or may not be. And this is in addition to what I presented the 28th um, for all the items that we normally fund. So the items on this list, um, are they in order of how they're going to be funded or they're, they are? Yes, so the, the, the committee's put them in, in the order of. Okay, so say the second row, the second column may not get funded or is that how, I'm just curious. If we, if we do not have the additional funds, correct, that is correct. We, we will then at, at that point if um, look for additional funding and other sources. Well, I, I just, I want to, I mean, I think we have a great list here and they're all important. And I just want to, on behalf of uh, um, the athletic departments at each of the high schools, no. <laughs> uh, uh, on behalf of the athletic departments at each of the high schools, I want to say thank you for looking at that because we haven't funded um, the, given them more money. And we're finding out that um, our students are, um, very, the money that they have is not enough to fund the programs that they have. And they're not being competitive against other schools because of that. And so I think it's really important that we, you know, what and I saw VAPA on there, so that we're very well-rounded for our kids. So I know that um, the uh, ADs did a, a survey of other districts and ours, were, ours district very severely underfunds their athletic program. So I know it's not the be all end all. I know it's all about academics, but the way we're going to keep kids in school is by having these other programs. So I just want to thank you for including that in there. So, and also the weight equipment. I mean, the weight equipment, have, I know at Bloomington High School, it's like you sit on it and it falls apart. So, I mean, it's ancient. It's been there since you were there and countless other principals before you. So I know that the high schools are going to really appreciate that as well. So thank you. Dr. Peterson, I just want to thank you for um, for always keeping us informed. You do a very, very good job, and I really appreciate that uh, on what's coming up. And and also, um, I appreciate the collaboration that you have with the with the different groups to get their input too. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. okay. Next item is um, six point two wellness. I'm sorry, where, where am I? I'm, I'm a little lost there. So, yes, 6.2, Wellness Policy, Business Service Division. I would like to invite Interim Assistant Superintendent Dignall to introduce Dr. Director and CISO. Good evening, board. Um, tonight, Director Eric and CISO, Director of Nutrition Service, will be um, giving a presentation on the proposed wellness policy. Thank you for that. Hello, good evening, uh, board president Flores, board members, superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. My name is Eric Enciso. I am the director of nutrition services, and I'm here to discuss the wellness policy and present it to you today. Next slide, please. A little bit of history on the wellness policy. It was first required by the school or the school nutrition WIC reauthorization act of 2004. Later, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 set new requirements for local school wellness policy. Its goal was to broaden implementation, evaluation, and nutrition education. This was followed by the local school wellness policy final rule of 2017. Its goal was to strengthen those policies and increase transparency. Next slide, please. The wellness committee um, got together from 2017 to 2022. Um, it's made up of various stakeholders. They met twice per year in non-COVID years. Their main mission was to comply with the final rule of 2017, and their outcome was a revised current policy format to make it easier to follow and understand. Next slide, please. The Wellness Committee was made up of experts, like the district nurse from PPS, um, a representative from the Dairy Council, San Bernardino County Department of Public Health representatives, our very own district nutritionist, 
nutrition educators from the San Bernardino County Superintendent, and some of the leaders of the district were also part of the committee team. There was principals there, there was school improvement office, there was the director of nutrition services, and even a board member was able to attend one of the meetings. In the future, we're going to be looking for students to be part of the wellness committee, school wellness councils, parents, parent groups, wellness site representatives, and district leadership. Next slide, please. What we did, so the wellness committee got together, they looked at board policy 5030 and the local school wellness policy final rule of 2017. And we realized that these documents cite a lot of ed code and have very formal wording. From that, we decided to come up with two documents. There's the local school wellness policy and the local school wellness policy resource pack. The local school wellness policy is an easier to follow document, which includes details and specifics and is not as intimidating. The local school wellness policy resource pack has easy to understand infographics, lists of approved foods, and posters promoting healthy living. It's kind of like our marketing. Next slide, please. The wellness policy is 16 pages long. In the next two slides, I have selected a, the major headlines and a sample sentence. I will now read a few. In the subject heading preamble, it reads, opportunities for all students to practice healthy eating and physical activity behaviors throughout the school day. In the subject heading school wellness council, it reads, each school within the district will designate a school wellness committee that convenes to review school level issues in coordination with the district wellness committee. In the subject heading updating, the wellness policy will be assessed and updated as indicated at least every three years. In the subject heading community engagement, it reads, Ensure that all families are actively notified of the content of the wellness policy, as well as how to get involved and support the policy. Next slide, please. In the subject heading nutrition, it reads, the district will provide teachers and other relevant school staff a list of alternative ways to reward children. In the subject heading physical activity, it reads, Physical activity during the school day will not be withheld as punishment for any reason. In the subject heading, frequently asked questions, there's going to be top questions regarding the wellness policy collected from the members and the public answered and um, for easy uh, access later on. Next slide, please. So what should we expect? we should expect that there would be an assessment of the effectiveness of the local school wellness policy on a triannual basis. You can expect the local school wellness policy to be revised. You can expect more outreach to community, virtual wellness committee meetings, collaboration with school sites, promotion of the policy at the site level, and more conversations regarding health. Next slide, please. I would just like to End it by answering any questions you may have. Thank you. Board President. Board, board. Yeah, I may. Thank you, Board President Flores. Um, and thank you, Director and CISO. I'm, I'm really excited that you're here uh, giving the presentation because I think uh, our nutrition department and uh, really the opportunity to introduce the ideas of health, wellness, um, healthy eating is really critical to our district. And I think we're, we're improving and, and there's room for improvement. So number one, um, we, know, we know the stats and the data about things like childhood obesity being on the rise. And it's more prevalent in communities that are lower income and minor, minority communities, which obviously we are. Um, and the challenges that these communities have when it comes to access to food, uh, fresh vegetables, fruits. I mean, the studies are all there. I'm glad public health is involved because they do studies about food deserts and parts of our community where you can't even get to a grocery store and you're relying on things from a liquor store or a market that doesn't have fresh fruits and vegetables. So our meals oftentimes are the healthiest meal 
that that child may eat throughout the day, throughout the week. Um, it's also why we provide meals throughout the summer and the break. So thank you for that as well. Uh, and what I hope this is an opportunity for us is to shift the way that we look at our nutrition services department and the program as a whole from being what was once viewed as a welfare program to what really is now about health, uh, healthy lifestyles, healthy eating for all students. And that matters because there was, and to some extent is a stigma around the free and reduced lunch program historically. I'll tell you personally, when I was a student in Colton Joe Unified, I qualified for free and reduced lunch. I never ate a single lunch from the cafeteria. I refused because I was afraid people would know I was poor. Honest to God truth. That was the stigma. I mean, we're talking many years ago, but that was the stigma around that program. If you had that lunch ticket, if you got in that line, it's because your family was low income. That, that simply has to go away, right? That stigma has to go away. And I think it is. I think it has to some, to a large degree it has. Uh, fast forward to today, we've talked about the nutrition program is for everyone. And even families historically that don't qualify, we should be marketing to them. So ironically, today, my children don't qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, and we paid. Uh, we're at a school now where all the students qualify because we're under special classification. But prior to that, we paid for them to have school lunch. Number one, because there's just some mornings I don't want to make. My wife doesn't want to make three lunches every morning. But number two, I want my children to sit at the same table and share the same meal as their friends, regardless of whoever's parents make what. I don't care. They're part of that community, and I don't want my children to, A, feel different, or B, look at others as they're different. And this is that opportunity to shift from a you know, what's supposed to be seen as a welfare benefit to what really is about nutrition and health. And thankfully, many of our schools follow now under the classification where all students um, qualify for, for the lunch and there's no cost for everyone. But to me, that's the, that's the starting point and make this about health and well-being and nutrition. And we can move away from, I think, those older uh, stigmas that classify this program as something that um, was seen as a welfare benefit. So, that's the opportunity here. Sorry, I just I'm passionate about that because I I saw it. We were we've done away with the program where we stopped giving kids lunches if they were overdue. I mean that we you've seen the passion that we have about not discriminating and making sure every child gets access to the same thing. Um, it's important because even in those meals, we're sending a message to them. We're sending a message to their families. So, um, thank you. That's really what I had to share, and I've I'm passionate about it personally. Thank you for sharing. And my kids, just you know, the rule is. Look at the calendar. You're eating three school lunches a week. I don't care which ones they are, but you have to pick three each week. And we make them do it. And it's, and it's great. And they enjoy it most of the time. But we also, um, it's, it's also about them participating and, and being able to sit with their friends. So anyway, thank you for that. Thank you, thank you Board Member Flores. And uh, any no other questions? Director and Cecil, thank you so much. Thank you. Moving on to items action uh, items we have items 7.1 through 7.61 uh, i would like to um ask if anybody would like to have an item considered differently a uh, different uh, separately seven okay 7.61 any others okay i uh, i need a motion for items 7.1 through 7.60. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, and I'll I need a second. A second. Um, okay, Mr. Ibarra. Okay. I have a motion by board member Flores and second by board member Ibarra to approve action items 7.1 through 7.60. All those in favor say aye. Nay. A motion by board member Flores and board member Ibarra and carried on a 7-0 vote. The board approved action items 7.1 through 7.60. Okay. Moving up to 7.61. Okay, I need a motion by board member Haro and a second by Thorin Ojeda. Okay, I have a motion by board member Haro and second by board member Thoring Ojeda to approve action item 7.61. Okay. 
discussion. I just want to thank um, everyone involved in the uh, negotiations and uh, for settling mm -hmm. <laughs> within the same school year, because usually it's like we're settling for the past school year, but, you know, going backwards. So I just wanted to say thank you to everybody and um, and pull it separately to acknowledge that. Thank you. Good job. Yes, thank you. And um, ditto, I think, from all the board members. Okay. So, do you want me to do the board? Is it done or do I need yeah, to do that? Okay, board. No, sorry. A uh, motion by board member Haro and board member Throwing Ojeda, Ojeda and carried on the 7 0 uh, vote. The board approved. Actually, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Okay. Now, <laughs> a motion by board member Haro and board member Thoring Ojeda and carried on a 7-0 vote. The board approved action item 6.1. Oh, I'm sorry, 7.61. <laughs> I got this, I'll get this. Okay, eight, uh, administrative reports, 8.0, I um, see. We have 8.1 through 8.6. Are there any questions and co or comments from board members on 8.1 through 8.6? Okay. Very good. Okay, item 8.7, facility update, we have no update. Item 8.8, .8, ACE update. I would like to invite President Parachi to, oh, you're done. Okay, you're done. <laughs> Item 8.9, CSCA update. We do not have a representative. Okay. Item 8.10, MAC update, no update. 8.11, ROP update. Okay, we did have a meeting. And uh, first of all, uh, we all had opportunity to witness uh, Bloomington High School's virtual enterprise company, Case of Armor, and uh, definitely a great highlight and a very good presentation by them. Very proud of what they were accomplished. They have accomplished. Um, also, um, 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 at Bloomington High School, law enforcement program hosted uh, a guest speaker from the Army National Guard. And in, in turn, junior students, uh, da uh, student Daniel took the necessary academic tests and joined uh, the, the National Guard. Uh, and also, uh, Bloomin High School Virtual Enterprise Company eCompact, as uh, Ms. Harrell mentioned, took first place in the Inland Empire Center for in, uh, Entrepreneurship Business Plan Competition winning $5,000 for the program. So just uh, reiterate uh, something that we have spoken about and how wonderful that program is. At Cone High School, automotive student Jerry obtained a part-time retail sales associate position with AutoZone. So it's showing that many of our students who take the ROP courses are able to transfer some of the skills into employment. Uh, at Cone High School, sports medicine instructor Meg Kelly led efforts behind the Safe Sports School Award. Cone High School is now the safest school for athletic competition in the district. 300 uh, eighth grade students toured Cone High School and obtained a firsthand experience of all the CTE programs. Uh, it's uh, it's been, I'll say it's been my effort and, and the effort of uh, the board of CRIROP to want to see uh, uh, ROP expand into the middle schools, which uh, we've implemented on the last year or two, and tr so that we could pave the way for many of the students who are interested in continuing learning at a vocational level at our high school. So it was good to see that they were able to take so many students so that they can uh, experience what programs we have available at our high school. And at Grand Terrace High School, the EMR, Emergency Medical Response students, 
holding ongoing uh, AED trainings after school for school site staff. So what they've done is not only have they learned how to do the CPR first aid, now they are training uh, the teachers and the staff at Grand Terrace High School how to do it as well. And uh, one final thing, uh, Grand Terrace High School graphic design classroom uh, was really uh, pleased because they're gonna get an updated computer lab and so that they could continue enhancing their skills and abilities in the 21 for 21st century as far as a graphic design and uh, commercial arts. So, I mean, you know, what we're providing for many of our students to cry Rob is incredible. And if you hear some of the stories that are shared to us, as Israel and Pat can contest, they're excellent. And many of our, our students not only utilize that as a, a launching pad to uh, good careers, but also uh, many of them will continue their college education in the fields of those choices. So, and they do well. Pat, or anything else? I don't want to take everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, last year, uh, they presented to us that last year, 1,871 students finished ROP programs, uh, and that's within the three school districts. And so they've been following up to see where these kids are now. And 600, uh, um, they were able to get a hold of 1,306 students. Um, 639 are in further education. 669 are working now and 35 are in the military. So I think it's really, uh, you know, and the others they were not able to get a hold of as of yet. Um, but I think it's really important to see that um, the programs do work. And then also, uh, again, a reminder about Wednesday, May 11th, is the ribbon cutting at four o'clock for the new, well, not the new building, but the new to us building, because we own it. Um, and then the five o'clock is the evening of excellence, where we'll be honoring students and giving them uh, giving them their uh, various uh, awards and uh, scholarships. So thank you to everyone. Okay, thank you. Moving on to 9.0, Superintendent's Communique. Good evening, Board President, uh, Board, uh, Executive Cabinet, and uh, community members. Uh, and so tonight's Communique, I want to start off with uh, the Bloomington Municipal Advisory Committee, the BMAC, as we call it. Uh, you see the team there, logo. So earlier this week, uh, as the board knows, uh, the, my office received a request from the Bloomington MAC to schedule a bridge committee meeting. Uh, so I'd like to ask the board members, and I know that we have already board members who participated in the last bridge meeting, it's been, it's been a while, uh, Mr. Fuentes, Ms. Haro, and Ms. Thornajeda. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, and receive consensus from the board to proceed with scheduling first uh, bridge meeting and also receive feedback if the board would prefer to continue with the same committee members. So well, I would like to ask if the members would like to continue. Okay, Mr. Fuentes, Ms. Haro. Is this will it be virtual or will it be uh, on site? That's, yes. Virtual. Yeah, we'll do a virtual meeting. I believe we have our three members that will continue. And I believe I have consensus from the board to move forward with the bridge committee. Consensus, yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yep. We have it. We will schedule that and then we'll put it on the board's calendar. So thank you for that. Nick? Sorry, no. Send us like several dates to make sure that all three of us are done. Oh. Absolutely. We will definitely take care of that. Oh, no, this is, a, this is a different one. Sorry, uh, this is a different slide here. This is, uh, yes. Uh, I apologize to the board in advance. Uh, this is another special board meeting I'd like to ask. In BC, we shared uh, information uh, with the board uh, about the next steps in the DSTP process. Uh, we are ready to uh, ask the board to have the special board meeting so uh, we can do a, a, what we're calling a crosswalk between the LCAP and the DSTP plan, which is, we're calling it the CGSD plan. So we're going to start using that terminology. So I'd like to request the board 
uh, to have this special board meeting. Uh, and you see the dates above there so that we can engage the board again in this conversation and this work that we've been doing for the last 18 months or so. Uh, and I know I've been working with President uh, Flores uh, on this uh, uh, in trying to get this scheduled. But uh, so I have the dates up there. Uh, so uh, Monday, May 9th, Tuesday, May 10th, or Monday, May 16th. So uh, the plan is to have our consultants, uh, Janice Case, uh, and then John Dately, and I think, sorry, John, I probably messed up your name, as always, the Atley. And there you go. See, Katina says I'm doing it right. Uh, and they, they've been working with us uh, on different uh, projects here in the district, primarily, though, with the uh, the DSDP and the redesigning, you know, the vision and the the plan. So we're really really ready to roll out the, and brand the the plan. However, I think it's important that we uh, uh, have this study session with the board so that uh, the board under, uh, knows the direction. So with that, I'll stop and and just ask if there's uh, a consensus uh, for any of these dates. Right. Okay. I would need a Tuesday night. Tuesday? Is that a, would that work for everybody? Yeah, Tuesday works. Is that okay with everyone? May 10th. Dia de las Madres. Okay. Great. Are we looking at uh, putting a limit on how long the meeting's going to be? Yeah. I, I have a reason why I'm asking. Uh, because the next day is the Cry Rops Evening of the Excellence. And it starts at 3 and ends at who knows what time? <laughs> Eleven, probably. So. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that a uh, great question, great point. I think uh, we, we're looking at maybe two to three hours max. We were going to keep the board there, uh, so we start at five thirty, uh, go seven thirty eight. I think after eight, I don't think anybody. So, or we can even start earlier if the board wishes. Yeah. I don't. Okay, I'm good. Yeah, that's fine. Five thirty. Five thirty, and we'll get you out by eight o'clock. Okay. Very good. We'll have dinner. We'll, and this just to so you know that this is a uh, open, not an open session discussion. So community members are, are will be welcome. Uh, but it's going to be an interactive process to get the board in next steps. So thank you, board, for that. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, 47th man of the year celebration, um, even though he didn't get it, I just wanted to uh, really take this time to congratulate Board Member Fuentes for being a finalist, excuse me, from the office of Eloise Reyes uh, uh, for the seventh, 47th district man of the year. Uh, so early today was a virtual celebration held uh, to for the nominees, and I know some of you uh, attended that it was a virtual so uh and you know the, the criteria really is nominees were selected because of their dedication to uh the community and so again congratulations publicly i wanted to publicly recognize mr fuentes uh for that nomination and recognition so congratulations let's give him a round of applause shall we all right appreciate that the, the last thing, and, and again, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, the passion that our board members have about college and career uh, and a lot uh, about Cry Rock. So I want to take this opportunity to highlight uh, an event that was hosted by Supervisor Baca's office uh, uh, that was catered to our high school seniors. And I got an opportunity to go there, and I tell you, it was just uh, uh, awe-inspiring for me because... Uh, to see uh, students from our uh, different high schools, Slover, a lot of Slover kids were there. So we had uh, about 50 students from our district who participated in the event over at the Work Development Center in the Inland, M uh, Inland Center Mall. Uh, just a great center for for uh, for our, our, our folks, uh, our students rather, and even for adults, because it's a workforce development. Uh, 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 well, I would say uh, the development uh, center that's what word i'm looking for center and so uh the event um involved many community partners school districts uh of course colton and uh participating in providing the students with college career 
and mentorship opportunities to students. We know that that's so important, that mentorship. Uh, many of us would not be here if we didn't have our mentors. Uh, and I know that for a fact, because I know I've talked to many of our board members and they've had phenomenal uh, mentors. And so uh, the event provided interactive workshops. I got to attend a couple of those. They gave student resources, tools, information pertaining to college and career opportunities. Uh, so it, it really was uh, engaging. And I was, again, in two of the workshops to provide students with really next steps following high school. And it's really that focus of that 16 year old to 24 year old. You know, it's not just after, but it's after high school too, uh, which is important. You know, uh, a lot of kids get stuck. I know I did for a while when I was like 20 or something. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I know that the information provided to the seniors was just great. Uh, and and I got to speak to many of them. Uh, and it, again, I mentioned resources. So uh, it really, the reason why I mentioned this and because it really ties into the vision that we have for the district. And that's uh, why I'm excited and passionate about this work, just like our board members, because it's about the necessary skills for these our students to thrive uh, if they want to go to college or in the global workforce. Uh, so uh, in, in all those viable career pathways, we know the world is uh, changing constantly. Uh, you know, uh, I was talking to a couple of students, I said, are you guys aware of Web 3.0, right? Web 3.0, and they're like, what's that? I said, oh, guys, I go, you guys have to learn about Web 3.0 because uh, that's the future, the, the artificial intelligence, the, you know, all, all that, it, it's here. So, so it, was pretty, it was pretty cool to, to be there with them, and uh, I really enjoyed it. I appreciate the uh, Supervisor Bacas. Ted Alejandro was also there at the event, and we got the opportunity to speak to our students. So I wanted to highlight that, and, uh, and with that, I will end my communique this evening. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Miranda. We have uh, now board member comments. I would like to start with board member Thorin Ojeda. We passed several resolutions tonight uh, for employee recognition in the month of May and April uh, for teachers, school classified school employee week, school nurses and uh, librarians or school library employees. Do we send something out to them um, or have you planned to do that for this year? Uh, we, we do a lot on social media okay. and we highlight them. So that's, uh, uh, we get we get the word out, uh, and we also send out uh, in our communication department. We also send out, um, you know, through email and things like that. Yeah, so to thank them for the work and acknowledge them from my office. So we have so many dedicated individuals in our district, and it would be nice to. I I, I knew we have in the past. I didn't know if we planned for that for this year. So I want to make sure we. I wanted to make sure I knew what you were doing. I guess I should say short answer, yes. <laughs> Thank you. I would like, uh, if you would please send us information on the fire alarm situation at Bloomington High School uh, in our board correspondence. Uh, I know I had a situation like that at my school for a while and they had to come in and fix it, so that's probably what occurred, but I'd like to know that. Uh, other than that, I don't have any other comments tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Board member Ibarra. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just wanna, once again, and I mentioned it earlier, is just thank all those who were involved in the settlement between uh, uh, the district and ACE, our teachers, and for the wonderful job they did to be able to get it before, uh, during the month of April. I know that that was uh, an important month. And uh, just want to say great job to all those who participated and uh, and thank you for your efforts on both ends. So that's all. Mm -hmm. Board member Flores. Okay. Board member Fuentes. Thank you, board uh, president uh, Flores. Uh, just a couple of items I want to comment on. Uh, first of all, thank you for our microphones. These beautiful microphones that we have, I uh, just want to take, thank the tech department. These are awesome. They sound nice. 
very clear. They got a little red light on there that lets you know that the microphone's on. So let's let's give it up for them. So thank you. I uh, also wanted to share, I was at uh, Bloomington High School yesterday for their job fair. And what an awesome job fair. I mean, Home Depot is there. Uh, let's see, in and out was there. Our HR department was there. I mean, it was, there was many others. The, the Army was there, the National Guard, you know, many of those were there. We even had the Riverside uh, Sheriff was out there. They had a booth out there too. And many other booths that were out there. And I just want to congratulate uh, uh, the staff for, for bringing that job fair out to our students. We have a lot of uh, young 16-year-old students that are going to work for the summer. And now that they can actually go out and work, this gives them an opportunity to kind of get a heads up, get that work permit, get out there and start working for some of these companies. And they're paying pretty good, man. And 17 bucks to start off at in and out So that's a good job there to, to start off. So uh, kudos to all of the, the job fair people and to the staff over at Bloomington High and to our H department, HR department, excuse me, that was there also. I uh, also wanted to share, I was, uh, first, and also I wanted to say thank you. Uh, as a man, one of the 25 finalists for Man of the Year, I want to say thank you to all my colleagues that were there this evening. All the comments that are on Facebook, everything. Thank you very much. I, I'd rather do it this way so that everybody knows. I know some of you were there and uh, ended up becoming one of the distinguished gentlemen for the 47th uh, district. And when I do get that award, I'll share it with everybody because it's not just me. It's all of us. You are all the man of the year. All the, my colleagues, everyone. You know, I, I wouldn't be able to do the job that I do as a board member if my colleagues weren't around. You know, all of them. And, uh, you know, it's it's a team effort. It's not just Mr. Fuentes or it's not just Ms. Haro or Mr. Ibarra. Or Ms. It's a team effort. We all have to work together to make a difference in our district. And, and we do make a difference in our district. Today, we saw what happens in our district with these young people. The, the virtual enterprise, the young le legislators that were here, the presentation from Grand Terrace. Wow, what a presentation. So going that way as vice president of the Crybop foundation alongside my president uh, frankie barra who is also the the president of the Crybop educational Find foundation i wanted to share that we have scholarships available for these kids and we we are on the the uh, evening of excellence we are going to share some of these scholarships with some of these students but we also need donations we need donations you know, your generous donation provides scholarship awards for deserving CTE students, career technical education. A lot of our students actually start off with scholarships. Even if it's 500 bucks, $100, $1,000, it makes a difference. You know, paying off tuition to get started, it makes a difference. So if you're able to donate to the CryRob Foundation, you can go to our web's webpage, www cryrop.org and you can make a one-time donation also for the evening of excellence we are going to have uh different pages that you that are going to be in the book you know that we're going to pass out, out to people if you want to be part of that you can go to our website again www.cryrop.org and you can you can look it up i know there's a date on there that i think there was a deadline for march uh March 31st, but I'm pretty sure we can squeeze you in. So if you there's business uh, business card size, a fourth of a page, have a page. If you want to, all these donations go towards these young men and women. And you you saw today, you saw what some of these pathways are doing, and they're making men and women that are going to have success in life. And if we were able to do it, they can do it. So if you can, once again, it's www.cryrop.org. Donate, donate to the foundation. It would greatly, greatly benefit. And, you, and I can tell you, if you do donate to this, uh, to donate for the scholarships, when you see that student, that student that gets that scholarship, I can guarantee you they'll come back. They'll come back and thank everyone who had a part, partake in that scholarship. That's all I have this evening. Everyone have a great weekend. God bless you. Thank you. Board member Sandoval. Okay. Okay. You can. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of things. Um, I would first of all like to. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> Board member Morrow. I apologize for that. I only had one thing, but now I have two. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, I just wanted to bring up um, our presentation this evening by our students at Grand Terrace High School was wonderful. The video was wonderful. Um, however, the comment I want to make is I think we've kind of lost sight of what student showcase was. Originally, when we started it, it was for the students to come and present and speak and talk to us and not necessarily just showing a video. And they would, um, you know, have their PowerPoint or what well, that was a long time ago. I don't know what it's called now, but <laughs> and and it would, you know, and it would have uh, all about because I didn't hear anything about really about academics in that presentation other than they had an academic celebration. Um, so it would be about academics, it would be about sports, it would be about plays, it would be about everything that they were doing and have done. And the kids, the students, I won't call them kids, would speak about what they've done. So it was, you know, the ASB students talking about what they had done and accomplished and the students had accomplished in the school. So I think, well, I think technology is great and a video is great. I know some of the schools have inserted a video in their presentation and then gone back to speaking. I think we need to think about that because, um, you know, we, we mentioned how important it is to get up and speak in front of people, not just come and present a video. So that's just my opinion, but I just wanted to voice it because I think we've kind of lost sight of what it was. The other thing I wanted to say about that video and is um, one of the scenes they showed uh, at the football game and where they released that powder. I remember Ms. Joanne remembers this, um, the, the powder up in the, in, in the stands, you know, like when they score a touchdown, it's whatever, tight and blue or whatever the color. And we had brought this up before is that, uh, and I thought we had said something about it to the site that um, we don't know uh, I know it's the students and, and they're doing it for pride and all that, but we don't know if other students around in that area or family members are allergic or have an, any kind of reaction. We don't know what that powder is. So we had brought up if there was another way they could express their excitement, like confetti or something that we know doesn't affect somebody. Um, I know I have asthma, I know that uh, board member Ojeda has asthma, things like that can trigger asthma. So I'm just erring on the side of caution and I want to bring it up. So um, that, so that was my extra thing that I brought up because of the video today. Um, my one thing I want to ask the district and I will, um, is if we can look into uh, on how it would affect our district, um, our NJROTC program. Um, like a lot of the programs, I know like our VAPA programs have suffered greatly during uh, COVID and their numbers are down. And right now they are estimating that to get the VAPA numbers back up to where they were pre-pandemic is going to take two to three years. The same goes with our NJROTC program. However, um, we, it's, it's, a, it's a call to action. Because in order for NJROTC to be partially funded by the Navy, we have to have a minimum of 80 NS1s, which is freshmen, in the program. Last year, uh, some that they were not allowed because of COVID, the counselors went to the school to recruit uh, students for the next year and sign them up for school for the next year. Well, the counselors don't really know a whole lot about ROTC. And in the past, you know, we've sent cadets down there and they do, you know, the flag and they talk to them and show them what they do and, and everything. Well, they weren't allowed last year. I understand that. Right now, we only have 30 students enrolled as NS1s at Colton High School and 30 at Bloomington as NS1s. We will lose our funding from the government for ROTC. There has to be 80 students in that program or close to it, you know. Um, I brought this and I'll give it to you, Dr. Miranda. 
uh, Area 11, which is part, a small part of Arizona and, and Southern California, which is where Bloomington and Colton High School both fall under. Uh, our Area 11 commander provided this to me uh, to the, and to the school site. And um, it has, we can come, Area 11 encompasses Phoenix, Tucson, Central Valley, San Fernandino, or San Fernando, Ventura, Orange County, Riverside Inland Empire, Temecula, and San Diego. In Temecula, all schools get full credit for, that's how we're gonna raise those numbers. They get full credit for PE. River, uh, San Diego, all but one school, they get full credit for PE. Riverside Inland Empire, out of six schools that have NJROTC, Colton, is the, Colton and Bloomington are the only two that do not give full credit for ROTC. My daughter was a four-year cadet in ROTC. They work actually harder than they do in regular PE. They have to run the mile, they have to do, they have to have very strigorous, strigorous, rigorous <laughs> that they have to do in that program. So I would like to see if we can please, please, please look into saving this program by offering it as we did it for, we've done it for a band where we've offered credit and this, this is long overdue and otherwise we're gonna lose this program. So I'm gonna pass this over, just as it just has numbers on it, but at least it gives you the information. And if we could get something in board correspondence as we look into it, I would really truly appreciate it. Um, this program, main, uh, uh, much like Science for it, it means a lot to me, because like I said, my daughter was a four-year cadet, and I don't want to see this program go away, because I've seen kids' lives completely turned around by joining this program. And not all have gone into the military, but it really does help them straighten their lives out. Um, and so tonight, my quote this evening, schools have a responsibility to support dreaming and doing in ways that ensure the success of all our students. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Haro. Of course. I'd like to see if I can get, uh, thanks to Pat for bringing that to our attention, uh, consensus from the whole board so that we could take a look at what we need to do to move forward into making that program, uh, give it a one unit credit. And, uh, I, you know, I think it's important for us to take a look at that and and make it kind of official at this point from all of us. So we, we will definitely take a look at it. At yeah, do we have a consensus for, yes. from the board? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have my comment tonight is focusing on, on the importance of um, early literacy and, um, and the importance, especially for our youngest scholars, our kindergarten to third grade, I'm glad Dr. Hyder's here because that, that's uh, in your department, um, is, you know, I, I have a lot of questions as far as how are we addressing literacy? Do we have a strong program uh, for our kiddos? Have we identified strategies within, you know, in our district that are across the, the the schools that are being implemented, you know, whether it's GLAD strategies or letters or whatever it is, um, you know, have we identified them and, and are implementing, and are we providing the appropriate professional development uh, for our student, for our K-3 teachers? I know all our teachers need it, but I'm, not, I'm talking specifically K-3, um, you know, just because we need to get our kiddos reading by the third grade. Um, also, have we reached out to K-3 teachers to to get their input, you know, what is it, you know, that, how are their kids, the kids doing? What is it that they need? Um, also, what other schools, is there a school in the district that is performing better than the others and are having success in this, in the literacy program? Um, do we have enough classroom libraries in these in K3 classrooms? So those are just all questions that I, I, I have uh, to make sure that we have a strong literacy program for, for our little ones. So um, just, uh, I'm bringing that up, and I've been, yeah, I've been talking to Dr. Peterson, and she, she knows how important this is to me. So um, the the last thing I have is um, I, I'm sure the the board received um, um, the a copy of the letter that that Superintendent Miranda and I received from a 
community member, Frank Reyes, and, and it's a formal request to um, name or rename a school or a building in the Colton Joint Unified School District in honor of Dr. Tom Rivera. Uh, who just recently passed away, uh, and you know, and he makes some points of the contributions that Dr. Rivera has had done, has done or did throughout the years, um, and he also uh, wrote some um, a list of of community members because I believe they started a commu uh, a committee in the community that are all in favor of this. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get consensus, consensus from the board uh, to give direction to Dr. Miranda uh, to look into this and form a committee and, and proceed with this. Yeah, as long as we follow our board policy to, to do it, I, definitely. I, well, I have a question with respect to, well, first of all, Absolutely love the idea. So mm -hmm. there's two points I like to make. First thing is procedural. Um, the policy says that we may form a committee, not that we have to. Right. I th and I think originally, well, I think that policy is, uh, that section of the policy and the committee is there primarily for things like when we're naming new schools and, and new facilities where we're, there's going to be, you know, several options are being considered, several names, and we're engaging the community. I, I don't know that it's necessary in this situation i think the board certainly has the authority because we already have the individual in mind so it's not a question of selecting which person to name so to speak um it's we have somebody in mind it's maybe identifying the appropriate facility there's a recommended facility colton so i i personally don't know that we necessarily need a committee because i'm not sure what they would study or focus with respect to you know identifying the individual the individual's already been identified so i i think i would be more inclined to simply give the direction to start the process um, that we need to go through with respect to staff. And obviously it has to come before the board for adoption, that's clear. But the committee is an option, so that's number one. Um, number two, uh, and again, fully in support of, of, of this, but I do believe the appropriate thing, um, the right thing to do is to make sure that we engage with Dr. Rivera's family, first and foremost. Um, Lily, his wife, Dr. Lily Rivera, uh, herself an accomplished leader, um, we would, we should get her blessing, quite frankly, or, and or the family through perhaps a spokesperson. But I, that's the right thing to do, um, certainly to make sure that they're comfortable. Uh, this is something they would want. Uh, and then invite them to be part of the process because identifying um, the building and typically we have an event and there's things around that. And we want to do it the right way. How is he going to be recognized? Will there be a plaque? What will be included in that? Uh, the appropriate thing, the honorable thing, and and is to do that in partnership with the family. But just as we've done with other facilities, I'm thinking of the Harold Strauss Wellness Center. The family was very involved in that, and I think that's the right thing to do. So, however, Dr. Miranda, you can work whether it's working with Mr. Reyes uh, or directly with 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 Lily or the family. Can we reach out and first first and foremost make sure they're they're supportive of this, and and if they are. Uh, then perhaps identifying a spokesperson from the family or whomever in the family is a point of contact to work with us because this will be a process. So those would be my only two caveats is, hey, I don't, I personally don't think we necessarily need a committee. Um, I think we can give the direction to move forward and then, but certainly believe we should work with the family. Wasn't, uh, just a quick clar clarifying question, wasn't um, a facility already, they already requested a certain facility, but they, not, not necessarily the family, but right. the, Mr. Reyes. Right, that's correct. Uh, they've requested uh, the Colton High School uh, Cafetorium or MPR. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Because uh, I've spoken to Mr. Reyes uh, and he's uh, spoken with uh, Dr. Uh, Lily yes, yeah. Rivera. Yeah. And, you know, of course, uh, she'd be open to that. Uh, of course, I would be more than happy to represent the board and talk to Dr. Lily about that about if uh you know the cafetorium uh, uh i'm sure i think that definitely that'd be something uh they would they would love uh her and her family uh i have not spoken with dr rivera or lily and you know of course it, but i love the opportunity and i i would say this that uh yeah so so answer a question uh, uh miss harrow the uh, the the recommendation or or the uh, was the MPR room because uh, really thinking about renaming of school site or a future site, we know that that would 
that's going to be many, many years from now. And so... Uh, it's a Colton High School grad. I was going to say, he's a yes, yes. high school grad, so I think that's an appropriate... Very proud yellow jacket. He was a very proud yellow jacket. Yes. So right. That's a, that's a perfect... Uh, perfect uh, building. Exactly. A perfect opportunity. And what that building represents for the for that campus and the school would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I would like for us to move as, as quickly as the family is comfortable with us moving. I, think. I agree. I agree with Dan. I think uh, we should do that. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, that's great. Uh, we'll... we'll uh, we'll do as the board, uh, uh, you know, suggests and or that the authorized new to move forward. I'd like to uh, just to request that before anything goes forward, that we take a close look at the, the policy just to make sure, because it's been our practice over the years to anytime we named anything to make it available for other outside people to also. If students wanted to name that facility, or if any other person wanted to add, uh, we've always done it that way. That's been kind of our history and what we've done. So um, I don't know the policy right offhand, uh, but uh, I would probably suggest that we take a look at the policy, make sure that if we move forward, we don't have anyone else coming complaining that they did not have an opportunity to add a name to that that they would like to see too. Uh, I can, yep. uh, again, I certainly uh, can. Uh, be naming it now. Yep. You know, so We've, before we jump the gun, yeah, I think we need to just make sure. But we did that with the Harold Strauss building too. I mean, they came to us and we all agreed and we didn't go out to the public or anything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Uh, once the board gave uh, me. I don't think anybody in the community would have a problem with that name. I mean, I think it won't, would not be a controversy at all. I, I would tend to agree with board member Harl, but I also think it's, I don't have an issue with making sure that in the next board correspondence, if you want to send us a copy of that board policy, I mean, this has to come back for us for a vote anyway, right? That's clear in the policy that has to be voted on by the board. Um, and so this will, this will come back as an opportunity for people to certainly chime in and, and provide comment. Um, yeah, right. And I believe there's a, sorry, I mean, could you know, there's a hearing that would need takes place. So at that, at that time, at the time of the hearing, the uh, community can, can uh, also voice their uh, opinions and uh, any yeah, other yeah. Rec recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. So, and we can, so I don't mind if you, maybe if you want to send us the, the policy so we have the complete and full policy, but I believe based on what I recall, um, it's within our authority to kind of move ahead with this and-, and That's correct. Um, it's a unique situation in this, where we have a monumental figure and I think it's appropriate. Um, but as always, the public will have a right and, and should have a right to chime in and, um, you know, that's yep. happy to hear from them. And, and, and they will. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. So we are adjourning into closed session to discuss items listed on the closed session agenda.
Back uh, from closed session. Um, going starting with item twelve point one, conference with legal counsel, uh, existing litigation. After conferring and uh, meeting in closed session, the board on a 7-0 vote approved the settlement agreement of litigation in case number CIVDS 2010871 for employee number 12720. Item 12.2, there were five student discipline items presented in closed session. Is there a motion to uphold the expulsion orders as presented? So and a second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Okay. On a motion of board member Fuentes and board member Thorin Ojeda carried on a 7-0 vote. The board upheld the expulsion orders of five student discipline items as presented. And the numbers. 1046415, Item 12.3. In closed session on a motion by Board Member Flores and second by Board Member Fuentes, the Board approved the following. The certificate, co certificate coach, head cross country boys, certificated regular staff. Two, we have a teacher on assignment elementary DRC, substitute administrator at grant. A classified management, one, classified HR analyst, uh, D district office human resources. Classified coaches, we have five head fresh soft football boys, band assistant co ed. Head Varsity Soccer Girls, Varsity Football Assistant Boys, Track Assistant Co-Ed. We have volunteer coaches. We have uh, three baseball boys, football boys, cheer co-ed. And we have volunteers, 12, the amount, number of 12. Okay, we are now adjourning at... Um, uh, oh, the motion was made by Mr. Uh, Board Member Fuentes and... Um, for 12.1, uh, Board Member Fuentes and oh, Thorin Ojeda. Yes. Okay. Okay. We are adjourning. It is now 10.20.